and welcome. I want to welcome our YouTube family. Uh, and uh, I'd like to uh, read our call to worship to our YouTube family, people who are on YouTube. It's, it's found in, in Luke chapter 2. And it's so appropriate because as we are getting ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, sometimes we can get caught up in other things other than Jesus. And, and sorry for those of you who have heard this for a third time, but that's okay. God's word needs to get into you. Um, in verse 13 of Luke chapter 1, it says... And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And so I hope that's you today in this Christmas season, that you're looking for what God has come to pass for you in your life and, in, and, in, and be an encouragement to those around you to also pursue that. That's, that's why we have church, to, to, to uh, exhort one another on towards love and good deeds and stuff. And so having said that, that's a freebie. Um, let's turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. And today we're going to look at Jesus the Promised One. Last week we looked at him as the son that was given. Today we're going to look at him as the promised one. And so we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. The, we're going to read the first seven verses. And so my title is Jesus the Promised One. And my thesis is this. This is my main thought. The Son of God has come to remove our burdens and shine his light into our hearts. Let me say that again. The Son of God has come to remove our burdens and shine His light into our hearts in order to set us free. And so before we read this, I, let me just give you a little bit of background. Last week we were in Isaiah 7 and, and stuff, and we, we noted last week that this Judah was going through some tough times. They were going through tough times because Uzziah, the great king who ruled for 52 years, had died. And, and Isaiah was called into the, into, the, into the throne room of God. And the Lord made a call to say, who will go for us? And, and Isaiah said, I'll go, I'll go. And, and remember, the Lord sent an angel to touch the lips of Isaiah with a, with a piece of coal. Because Isaiah said, I'm, I come from a, a people of unclean lips. And so God cleansed Isaiah for the job. And then told him that your job will be to tell these people the truth, but they're not going to listen. You know, and, and so um, not only had Uzziah died, but then 16 years later, his good son, Jothan, also dies. And then Ahaz, who is not a good king, he's now on the throne, okay? And he's got problems because the Assyrians, actually, actually in, in chapter 7, we saw that the Syrians and the northern kingdom were trying to remove him from his throne. So he had that problem. Okay, but then he also had a problem with God. God gave him a command, ask me for a sign. He failed to obey the command of God. And then it got worse because now the Assyrians are coming into the area to conquer. And the northern kingdom by this time is probably already conquered. Okay, by the time this passage has come to pass. And so let's read the passage beginning with verse 1. And this is Isaiah. It says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They have rejoiced before you according to the joy of harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil for you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian for every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire and then these two famous verses that we put on our Christmas cards for unto us a child is born unto us 
a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name and we invite your Holy Spirit. We invite his love and his power and his insight to come down upon us, to open up our ears and our eyes, to be able to receive from you exactly what we need, Father God. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the Christmas season. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the most incredible event, event in the history of mankind, man being invaded by the world of God through the Son of God. And Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for our blessings. We thank you for this time. And we ask, oh, now that you would open up these scriptures that we may grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. For those of you who are taking notes, I've got three main points, as usual. Okay? My first point is, God's light will shine. My second point is this, man's burdens will be removed. And my third point is, the Son of God will be given. God's light will shine, man's burdens will be removed, and the Son of God will be given. Now, there might be some cynics out there. You say, you know what, pastor, pastor, you know, emphasize the P, pastor. You know, you live in, a, you live in an illusionary, imaginary, make-believe world where everything is nice and pretty and happy and lovely. And, you know, and I would say to you, try being a pastor for two weeks and you'll find out that's not true. Okay? But I'm not the only one that deals with ad adversity. And I know some of you might even be going through diversity. You might be going through hard times. You might be struggling with the enemy, struggling with your flesh. I want you to know something. The things that God does, the miraculous things that God does for us and to us are not done in a bubble. He is in, he's in the mainstream crowd. In fact, we, you know, when, when Jesus was praying for us, he prayed that we would be in the world, but not of the world. Christianity was not meant to be only practiced in, inside the walls of a sanctuary. It was meant to be brought out into the marketplace, out into our homes, out into our workplace. It was meant to be public. Everything that Jesus did was very public. He came the first time. That's a, that's a historical fact. Jesus Christ is the most verified historical personage in all of history, bar none. More historically certified than Caesar, William Shakespeare, George Washington. You can pick any historical figure you want, and Jesus is the most verified one of them all. So we're not dealing with make-believe. We're dealing with reality. In fact, I've been told that history is his story. And the hist history has proven the Bible, the Word of God, to be true over and over and over again. So let's take a look at our first point. We know that, Israel, that Judah was in big trouble, okay? They had a bad king who was ruling over them. And I want you to know something. When the leader of a nation is evil, the whole nation suffers. There's something that God has, has made a certain type of special connection between the leader of a nation and the nation itself. It doesn't mean that the people in the nation can't be righteous and can't kind of, you know, be a, you know, a, a, a stemming of the evilness. But the problem is, when the, when the leader of a nation is evil, the whole nation suffers even the righteous within that nation. And so here you have Ahaz. He is a bad guy. He wouldn't even ask God for a sign. He pretended to be all pious, but the reality was he was worshiping false gods. He wanted nothing to do with the one true God, so he refused the command of God to ask for the sign. God gave it anyways, because it is God who establishes kings and removes kings. And the truth and justice of our God will prevail in the end, no matter how pervasive evil may look on the outside. In the end, evil will disintegrate through, uh, uh, because of the light of Jesus Christ and his power. Okay, And so the first point, God's light shall sh shine. Here it says in verse 1, it says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon who is distressed. Can you imagine Isaiah telling these people, Look, I know it's bad, but the gloom's going to be gone. Sometimes when I've counseled people who are really depressed, 
and I tell them it's going to be okay. Jesus is still on the throne. Sometimes it's hard for that person to see that because the darkness just seems to be so pervasive all over them. And so Isaiah is telling them the gloom is not going to be upon you anymore. As when he first lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, after he more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea and by the Jordan in the, in the, in the Galilee of the Gentiles. The Assyrians had brought darkness into the land. And Isaiah is saying, God's going to remove that. God's light is going to shine. Look at verse 2. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, and upon them a light has shined. What is Isaiah talking about? The Assyrians are conquering everyone around them. The, the, the nation of Judah has a bad king. It's dark. Everywhere it's dark. And Isaiah is saying, No, the people will see a great light. He's getting prophetic. He's beginning to show them the future. You see, God wants us to know that we have a glorious future ahead of us. That has always been God's MO for his people. We have verses in, in, in the letters to the Corinthians where God tells us through the Apostle Paul that we can't even begin to imagine or understand what God has for us. It is too incredible, too awesome, too great. J the book of James tells us, even as Holy Spirit filled indwelt believers and baptized in the Holy Spirit, that right now we can only see dimly. And one day we will see Jesus face to face. And what I see right now is pretty awesome. I can't imagine how awesome it's going to get when it's really clear. You know? It's kind of like, it's kind of like when you're driving a car in a hilly place and it's dark but it's it's kind of like real early in the morning right and it's real dark around you and you're driving and driving and all of a sudden the sun begins to peak and you've got a little bit of it but it isn't until you get over that mountain and you see the full splendor of the sun that you can really see what's going on very clearly and that's the way it's going to be for us for those who love Jesus Christ we are going to see the like God said he was going to remove the darkness and God tells us that he will remove our gloom. Do you want to know how God removes our gloom? Would you like to know how God removes our gloom? I'm going to tell you how God removes our gloom. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to take a look at verses 7 and 8. God wants to remove our gloom, but there's, you know, just like a, a, a surgeon who has to operate a certain way, the, God has a certain way of operating and removing gloom from our lives, and it requires a bit of cooperation on our point, because as a, you know, if you go into a doctor's office and you're fighting with a doctor every time he's trying to do something, <laughs> you're not going to get a healing and stuff, and, and so uh, you need to be a cooperative patient. And so in Philippians chapter Chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, we're going to see how God removes gloom from the heart of the, the believer or even an unbeliever if they will come to him and, and submit their lives. It's actually um, beginning with verse 6 instead. I, uh, for a little, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Look at the, the, first, the first recipe is God doesn't want us to be anxious. And I believe that the reason why God sent Isaiah to, to the nation of Judah is God did not want the nation to be anxious. He wanted them to know that God has a future for them. Jeremiah, who comes after Isaiah, tells them that. Okay? That, that God's not there to hurt them, but he wants to give them a future, a glorious future. And it requires that we trust him, that we're not anxious, but what? In everything by prayer and with supplication and thanksgiving. When you're in trouble, bring your troubles to God with thanksgiving. You gotta, God wants us to bring them. You know, Jesus said in the Gospels, we have not because we ask not. So we need to ask. But we need to bring our supplications with thanksgiving before God and just be, not allow the anxiety of the situation to overwhelm us. To put our trust in God that ultimately God's going to work it out. Romans 8.28, last time I checked, hasn't changed. And it says, and we know that all 
all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And it's hard because we want certain things to happen a certain way. And when God doesn't do it our way, we get upset. We get upset with God. We get upset with our circumstances. We become depressed. And what, what's, the, what's the recipe of overcoming the anxiety and the depression? It's right here in verse 8. Okay. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And let me ask you, who illustrates every single one of these attributes more than any person in the universe? That's right. That's right. You know one of the reasons why I like Christmas? Is because I get to meditate on things that are pure. What can be more pure than the birth of the Savior of Jesus Christ? What can be more lovely to see the miracles of God, the prophecies of God, being fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ? What can be more praiseworthy than that? You know, and I believe that a lot of depression is because our focus on Christmas isn't on Jesus as much as it is the festivities. And I'm not against festivities. I am a Christian, uh, I want to be careful what words I use here, um, celebrator. <laughs> I like parties. I like to have a good time. I like hanging out with people. I like eating food and drinking good, you know, good, you know, good soft drinks. I don't drink hard drinks. I, I don't do hard drinks, but soft drinks and stuff and, and just being with people and celebrating and think about and being happy. You know, I, I'm the kind of person, I like movies with happy endings. I don't like movies with bad, sad, evil, bad endings. That drives me crazy. You can ask my wife, Wendy. She knows. If, if, I, if I see the movie, it's going to end bad. I'm like, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I don't even want to see it. You know why? Because I want to see what is good, not what is, what is evil. I want to focus, because you know what? We become like the gods we worship. And Egypt and Israel are two perfect examples of that. Okay? What did the Egyptians worship? Do you know, do you know what their number one god was? The scarab, which is a dung beetle. And if you look at Egypt right now, Egypt is pretty much just a big toilet, really. Because they worship the dung beetle. But right next to it is Israel. That's green. Egypt is brown and smelly. Israel is green, wholesome, and one of the bread baskets of the world. Why? Because they worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the living not the God of the dead. And, and what was Egypt noted for? Worshipping the dead. Right? We want to worship life, not death. Let's go, okay, let's go back to Isaiah. Enough, enough of that. Okay. God said those walking in darkness would see a great light. And this is in the area of uh, Zebulun and Naphtali. And you know what? That's the first place where Jesus Christ preached the gospel. When Jesus started his ministry, the first place he preached the gospel was in Zebulun and Naphtali, the very two tribes that are featured in the gloom and darkness of Judah's present day condition. I'm here to tell you, brother and sister, it may be dark now, but you're going to walk in the bright light of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. You know? Romans tells us, if God demonstrated his love towards us while we were yet sinners, how much more will he demonstrate his love towards us who love him? I was counseling with a friend of mine who, who was praying, and, and she had been struggling with a little bit of depression, and, and, and verses would come to her mind like, oh, your, your, your mouth, uh, you know, you honor me with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. You know, and, and, and the reason why that was significant, because I had been counseling with them the previous week, and I said, you know what, you know what you ought to do? You ought to tr set aside some time to, in order to battle the depression. It's set aside some time where you just worship Jesus, and if you can't worship him, begin with the sacrifice of praise. And so she was doing it. She was giving God the sacrifice of praise. And while she was giving Jesus the sacrifice of the praise, you know who preached to her? The devil. The devil is a preacher. And if you don't believe me, check out Matthew 4. He preached to Jesus. But the problem with the devil's preaching is it's out of context. And it's a lie. And you know what the devil is telling her? The devil is telling her, your, your heart is far from me. You're, you're, you're honoring him with your lips, but your heart's far from him. 
I want you to know something. There's a secret to worship. I really believe this. The Bible says the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Okay? Secondly, there is the sacrifice of praise. Praise is a fruit of your lips. Okay? And so when, when I'm in a hard time, I just start praising God. Even though I don't feel like it, I just start praising God. And I learned this from my buddy David. David Lambert. Shout out to David there. And, uh, and so I just start praising God, you know, even though I didn't feel it. And you know what? As I continue to praise God and consistently praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, eventually praise turns into worship, which is from the heart. Okay, and that's what I was trying to get her to do was to give the sacrifice of praise so that she could enter into the heart of worship. Okay? And the devil was saying, oh, your lips are with the Lord, but your heart is far from God. He's a condemner. And I said, I quoted to her Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We have the Spirit of God in us. We walk according to the Spirit of God. There is no condemnation on us. In fact, at the end of that chapter tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Right? And so she goes, wow. It, the, the light went on. The light went on because of God's word being given to her with authority, with conviction, with belief. God, you know, wants us to walk. You know, he doesn't always show us exactly how the, the, the problem is going to unfold. You know what he says? He says, follow me. Follow me and I will be with you. And even if something, even if the worst thing happens to us, what's, what's the worst thing that can happen to us right now? We could get killed. Some psycho could walk into this church and blow my brains out because I'm preaching the gospel. That's probably the worst thing that could happen to me right now. But guess what? If he did that, I would be in the presence of God. I would be opening my eyes in eternity. So what do we have to lose? How does the Christian lose? We only lose if we allow ourselves to lose. And I'm not saying this to condemn anyone. So don't, don't be condemned if you're struggling with your emotions. Don't do that. Don't, don't condemn yourself. Throw yourself on the mercy of God and just keep loving, saying, Jesus, I love you. This, I, I, I hate what's going on right now, but I'm just going to trust you that you're going to get me through this because I, know you, because I know that you've called me to better things. You know, unfortunately, I, you know, it would be easier if God just saved us and brought us home, wouldn't it? It would be a lot, mess, lot less messy. You know, but you know what? God is developing us into his children. Okay? We, and he does that through adversity, unfortunately. And with blessings as well. It's, it's not a one-way street. All right. Man's burden will be... Only God can increase our joy. Right? Nehemiah 8.10. What does it say? The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's your strength, brothers and sisters. The joy of the Lord. Not your joy. You say, I don't have any joy. Good. Your joy would just get in the way. Ask God for his joy. And I believe he can supernaturally give you his joy in spite of even facing death or dire circumstances or problems or, you know, you know whatever, 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 whatever Goliath is in your life. God can give you the faith of David to pick up that sling and go, pew, pew, pew. let that stone fly, smack him in the forehead and then take the word of God to cut off his his head. Nehemiah 8.10. Okay. God wants to give us a great harvest. Look at verses 3 through 5. It says, You have multiplied the nation and increased its joys. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest. As men rejoice, they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff off his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. What was the day of Midian like? Do you remember the story of Midian? The story of Midian, it was, it was Gideon. Okay, and Gideon was chosen to judge Israel and to throw off the oppression of Midian and its allies, and and the odds were stacked against Gideon. He had about ten thousand men, I think it was, but the Midianites had way more than that. Okay, and he's getting ready for battle, and God says to him, "You got too many guys." <laughs> what? We're outnumbered thirty to one. We have too many guys. They have too many guys. He says, no, you have too many guys. And so he allows them to drink from a brook, and God spick, piss, 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 I feel like Porky Pig. Specifically tells them, if a man drinks like this, he's gone. If he drinks like that, keep him. And before that, 
God said, ask anyone who's afraid. Have them leave. So the first test was, are you afraid? The ones that were fearful left. And then he pared down the army even more to 300 men. That's all he had. But what, how did God defeat the Midianites? Think about it. They blew trumpets, and they had pots with light in them. And they smashed, the, and the light frightened the enemy forces, and they turned on one another and defeated each other. How is God going to deliver us? He blows a trumpet, Amen. and he sheds his light, and our enemies will defeat themselves. Because the Bible says, the snare that the wicked sets up for the righteous, he himself will fall into that snare. Rough translation there. Rough translation. It's true. The snare, think about it. The devil is the perfect example. Do you think the cross was a snare by the devil for Jesus? I think so. What did that do? Set us all free. What the devil intended to catch us with, he himself got caught instead and defeated by the blood of the Lamb. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. God wants to break the yoke of our heavy burdens. And God, you know, I, I, God, one day God's going to remove war from the earth. There's going to be a day, a time of peace where there is no more war, but not yet. Because we have a battle. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us that our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers of wickedness in high places. Okay? But the good news is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual to the pulling down of strongholds and taking captive vain imaginations and evil thoughts and bringing everything under the lordship and deity of Jesus Christ. That includes demons and devils and Satan himself. You know how I pray for our president and for our country? Well, the first thing I do is I go right at the devil himself. I go, in Jesus' name, Satan, we, because I always hook myself up with Jesus, we bind you, we cast you down, we cast you out, and we cast you out of America. You say, come on, preacher, you can't do that. Yes, I can. All authority has been given to us. He has given us power over demonic spirits, over principalities and powers. We need to use it. I don't think we realize the power that we have in our prayers. Let me tell you, the, the, the pagans do. I'll never forget, I was uh, uh, watching this Bible prophecy uh, seminar, and the late Grant Jeffrey was being interviewed, and he started talking about um, you know, Bible prophecy and all the great things that were going on. And he, he relayed this story. He said, he said, I got so irritated that one day I confronted an American media mogul. And I said to him, why don't you tell the American people what's really going on? And you know what the media mogul said without batting an eyelash? He said, we don't want the Christians in America to know what's going on because if they did, they would pray. We are praying, but I don't think we're praying the way, completely the way we should be, not as a whole. Maybe, maybe you as an individual are, but I think the body of Christ could stand to be praying a whole lot more. You know, about a year ago, about around this time, the American Christians flooded the voting booth and we're, we're, we're going to state capitals and we're listening to Franklin Graham exhort us to pray and worship and over 8,000 8, Americans got saved and I believe that the course of a nation was changed because let me tell you something the forces of evil had a plan for this country and their plan was working they were winning on every single front and God said no you're not and it changed the course of the nation I believe that with all my heart okay and you know what Here's the proof. We have just witnessed an historic event in the life of the United States of America. Our president, President Donald Trump, has declared that they're going to move the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Amen. It is. Dude, that is you, that, that's huge. Because there were 12 other presidents before him that said that they would do that and failed to do it. He did it. And I think back to that scripture that says where God was talking to Abraham and he said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse. And I don't know what your opinion is of Donald Trump. Maybe you don't like him as a person. But let me tell you something. That, that case right there, he did the right thing. And you know what, Mr. President? Kudos to you. 
kudos to you. Praise God that you had the spiritual insight to do that. And you know what else he did? He's removing the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson, uh, which means that I, you know, before I couldn't say this in a sermon without fear of my license being yanked from me and possibly charges being brought against me. But now I have the freedom to state how Jesus wants to affect America. I have the freedom to do that. We need to be praying. You know what? We sh I hope you didn't stop praying for the country once the election was done because that's, that, wasn't, that wasn't the end. It's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. And let me tell you, great things are happening in America. And we need to grab a hold of it. We need to focus our mind on things that are good and noble and praiseworthy. Praise God. Okay? All right. Point number three. The Son shall be given. For unto us a child is born. That statement right there tells us that Jesus is human. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He's human. God became man in the flesh. It tells us in the Gospel of John that he tabernacled amongst us and we beheld his glory. You know what? If you're born again, guess what? Jesus has come to you. Personally. Just like he came to the earth to fulfill prophecy. Because remember what last week's sermon was. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Son of God is coming. The Son of God has come, and the Son of God is on his way to come. He's in the, he's, he came almost 2,000 years ago. He's constantly coming into the hearts of those who are being born again. And one day, he's going to physically come back and establish the throne of David and rule over the new heavens and the new earth forever. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us, actually the book of Hebrews tells us, that Jesus is going to continue to rule, but he must bring all his enemies under his foot. And the last enemy he's going to bring under his foot is death. And my friends, that's when we rapture out of here. Boom. We are called up into glory. Death has no more sting upon us. Why? Because Jesus has already secured the victory for us. And we will see him as he is, and we will become like him, and we will be doing, we will be doing things that will blow you. In fact, the Bible says your mind can't even conceive of the things that you're going to be. Your heart can't understand all the things that you're going to be doing because of the glory of Jesus Christ in you. When the sons of God are glorified, we are told in Romans chapter 8, Jesus himself will be glorified. That's the whole, that's the whole point of the rapture. Jesus is coming back for his property. You and me can't wait. But until then, we gotta, we got to live in this oyster, irritating it, so it can puke up on us and make us bigger and bigger and bigger so that we can be that big, fat pearl on the neck of Jesus Christ for all eternity. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. The sun will be given. Isaiah calls the Messiah a child to show his humanity. Isaiah calls him a son to show his godhood. It says, unto us a son is given. He is the son of God. He's not just a man. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a good teacher. He is God in flesh. What else does Isaiah say? He predicts seven things. He predicts in verse 7, okay, he predicts that, that the government will be upon his shoulder. He predicts that he will be called wonderful. He is called wonderful. I think he's wonderful. I like to call him wonderful God all the time. God, you're wonderful. You know? Next, he will be called counselor. Okay? He does counsel with us. He will be called Mighty God. He will be called Everlasting Father. He will be called Prince of Peace. And He will rule forever. I want to I read to you Tim LaHaye's commentary 
on these two verses, verses 6 and 7. Listen to this. It says, Again, using the prophetic perfect, the prophet sees the gift child as though he were already born. This divine child is Emmanuel. The word wonderful indicates a miraculous nature, while counselor is often used in parallel with a king. Okay? And suggests that the counsel given by this godlike king will be miraculous. The strongest of the divine titles is Mighty God, is used to describe one who is indeed God Himself. And as a child, He is born, but as a son, He comes from eternity and thus shall be given. He is the Prince of Peace, a benevolent ruler with His millennial kingdom, will bring eternal peace on the earth. Thus, the obscure figure of Emmanuel is now revealed as none other than Jesus Christ Himself. God incarnate. That's awesome. I read stuff like that and I go, wow. I don't think we realize how significant this event is. Think about it. Not only was this time dark in, his, in Judah's history, but when Jesus came to the earth, Israel's history was very dark then. They were under the authority of the Roman Empire. Some six or seven years after Jesus was born, the Romans stripped them of what they felt was their sovereignty. And that caused their Pharisees and their scribes and, and the religious leaders to tear their, coat, their robes and put ash on their head and walk through the streets of Jerusalem mourning because they thought the word of God had been, excuse me, the word of God had been broken because Shiloh hadn't come. And now the scepter was no longer in Judah's hands. Because you've got to remember, the last, the last rulers that the Romans conquered in Israel were the sons of the Maccabees, who were from the tribe of Judah. They were ruling under the Davidic mandate. And they were removed. When the Romans conquered Israel early in their history, that's when the, that kingship was removed. And of course, the Romans established false kings like Herod. You know, Herod bribed his way onto the throne of Israel. There was no kingdom of David. It was, it was, he was called the king of Israel, okay, because of a bribe. And so, these Pharisees, they thought that Shiloh, the Messiah, hadn't come. And so they're mourning because they thought God's word was broken. Foolish Pharisees. To think that the very words of God can be broken... One of my favorite bands, Disciple, has a song. Their words cannot defeat us. God is with us. He will lead us. The devil cannot break God's word. If, the, if, if, you, if you hold on to nothing else, hold on to the fact that the devil cannot break the word of God for anyone. If we put our trust in him, he saves us to the uttermost. If we put our trust in him, he saves us from all wrath that is to come. Including tribulation wrath. I don't know why we have preachers and teachers who want to insist that the church is going to go through the tribulation because that's not the God I serve. We're his virgin bride. Why would he beat up his virgin bride? What kind of bridegroom would he be? That just goes contrary to the very nature of God. And yeah, I've heard all, well, this generation of Christians is the worst generation of Christians ever to live on the planet. Oh, really? I've probably lived through a couple of generations. And let me tell you something. They were pretty much the same. And you know what? If you think previous generations are so great... Take a look at Martin Luther King, one of the great reformers. I'm not, I, I, I want you to know I have great respect for Martin Luther, okay? Did I say Martin Luther King? I'm sorry, I meant Martin Luther. Take a look at Martin Luther, okay? Great reformer, okay? Did many great things. But you know what? You know what his attitude towards uh, uh, Jews were? They're Christ killers. Christ killers. What kind of attitude is that? You know what his attitude was about unschooled preachers who took the Bible literally, he put out death warrants upon their heads. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, do I think Martin Luther was saved? I do. I, th I, I think Martin Luther's going to be in heaven. But, he, but that's pretty carnal, if you ask me. Because I know one thing. I don't call Israel Christ killers. Because, because that's not the truth. You know who killed Jesus? We did. You did. I did. Our sin killed Jesus. Oh, and if you want to be technical, it was Gentiles who actually drove the nails through Jesus' flesh, not, not Jews. So, so no, no, they're, they're not, not, not. Were they complicit? Absolutely. You know why? Because the Word of God says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've got to stop being so arrogant and proud about our heritage and, and what we are and realize that God wants us to be humble and to admit that no matter whether we're Jew or Gentile, male or female, rich or poor, slave or free, we're all sinners that need saving. And that no one, and you, you know, I, I, used to, I used to blow the minds of my youth groupers when I said, you didn't realize that the blood of Jesus Christ could have saved Adolf Hitler? <laughs> what? Hitler! Hitler! He's evil! Oh, don't stop it. Let me ask you this, how great is our God? Is the love of God great enough to save Hitler? Yes, it is. Now, I'm not saying he is saved. Okay, so don't go running around, oh, pastor's preaching Hitler is a Christian. No, 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 no. I don't think he is. Because, because when you look at his life and the fruit of his, of his life, it, it's not godly, okay? But the potential for God to save Hitler is there. The potential. That means God can save anyone. Okay? And so, what, is, what does Jesus ask us to do? He says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. You want to harvest? Pray to the Lord of the harvest. And let him, you know, separate the ones who are going to be saved and the ones who aren't going to be saved. The elect from the non-elect. Okay? And, and, and again, I want, to, I want to touch this issue of being elect. I'm not saying that you, can, that, that you don't have to do anything to be saved. No, you, you, need to, you need to ask Christ to take over your life. You need that. How can God accomplish all of this with his zeal. Look at, look at the end of verse 7. It says, well, actually, let's read the whole verse. It says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over, over his kingdom, to order and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God is going to bring you peace. God is going to bring you joy. God is going to bring you judgment, justice. God is going to bring to you righteousness. God is going to bring to you no condemnation. God will deliver you from his enemies. Why? Because his zeal is great for you. What love has bestowed upon the Father but by the Father, that we should be called the sons of God. God has great zeal for you. But the devil's going to tell you different. The devil's going to tell you, oh, well, you know, God's blessing everyone else. Everyone else is doing great. You're second class. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't care about your problems because he's too busy taking care of everyone else. That's a lie. God has just as much zeal for you as he does for anyone else. And his zeal will accomplish it. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of my faith. The Hebrews. Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of my faith. So, so what are we left to do? What should we do, preacher? Glad you asked. Well, let's follow the scriptures. Let's take, a, let's take a look at what Jesus did. You know, a, a while ago, they came out with those bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do? do? That's, you know, I thought that was awesome. Because you, you had a lot of teenage, teenagers running around with these bracelets. You know, and my prayer is that it would remind them, uh, you know, uh, what would Jesus do? You know, you got a girlfriend with you and you're on a date, what would Jesus do? You know, uh, you know whatever, you know. You're in a store, you don't have enough money to buy something. What would Jesus do? <laughs> you know? All right, anyways, turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 
chapter 4. And I, I, uh, I, it's the first 17 verses, but I don't want to read all of the 17 verses because time is running short. Um, suffice it to say, the first 11 verses is Jesus going into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he is, first of all, he was led by the Spirit there. Okay? If you're in a wilderness right now, the Holy Spirit has led you to that wilderness. How do I know that? The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. See, we only like that when we're in a good place. Oh, praise God, I, I, you know, I've got a well-paying job, my wife loves me, the dog doesn't bite me, everything's going wonderful, my bills are paid, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Oh, praise God, it's awesome. <laughs> but what if we're in a desert? Is he still directing our steps? Or is something askew there? I'll give you a clue. If something is askew, it's not God. Okay. But anyways, in the, he was led by the Spirit, and then he was tempted. God allowed his son to be tempted. Do this, and I'll do this. The devil preached to him the word of God and tempted him to do things that he knew were, were wrong, even though Scripture was being given to him. And he, every time he corrected the devil, he would say, it is written. It is written. So what did he do when he was tempted? He quoted scripture. Yeah. It is written. It is written. It is written. He quoted scripture. And then when he came through the test, okay, when he came through the fire of the wilderness, he's hungry. He's, he's fasted for 40 days. He's being tempted to eat things he's not supposed to eat. He's been tempted to glorify himself in an improper way. The devil actually offered him all the kingdoms of the world. The devil offered him a shortcut to ruling the world. And he said, no, it is written. And then what? Beginning verse 12, it says, Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of where? Zebulon and Naphtali. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sit in the region, the shadow of death, light has dawned. And then look at verse, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what is our conclusion? We need to follow Jesus' example. We need to let the Spirit of God lead us where He wills. You're not the boss of you. God is. Secondly, we need to resist temptation. The Bible tells us there's no temptation that is common to man is given to you unless God gives you a way of escape. We need to resist temptation. Thirdly, we need to quote Scripture. Best way to get out of temptation? Quote Scripture. That would be the best way. Can't quote something you don't know. Oh, I guess we should be studying the Word of God. And then finally, we need to preach the gospel. We need to preach the gospel. And, and, and Francis of Assisi said, if necessary, use words. <laughs> we need to preach the gospel. And if necessary, use words. For those of you who aren't great speakers, you might say, well, I can't preach the gospel. Yes, you can. By your life. People can look at you and say, there goes a virtuous man. There goes a virtuous woman. And you never know who's watching. Sometimes when you think you're all alone, somebody's watching. I can guarantee you, God's watching. You know why? Because he loves you so much, he can't take his eyes off you. Unto us, a child is given unto us a son actually unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and his name is Jesus let's pray father Lord we know that in order to have the light of Jesus Christ inside of us we have to admit to you that we're sinners 
We have to submit ourselves to you and say, Jesus, come into my heart and make me a new creature. We have to believe in him and put our faith and trust in him. And then we have to study your word so that we can build up our faith and please you. And Father God, I pray for my friends and family here and the people on YouTube that they would do that very thing, that they would, that they would be like Jesus, that they would allow the Spirit of God to lead them wherever they need to go, that they would resist temptation, that they would quote Scripture, and that they would preach the Gospel. Lord, as we celebrate the Christmas season, I pray, God, that you would give us opportunities to shine the true light of Christmas. It's not about Christmas trees and Santa Claus and Rudolph and Frosty. It's about Jesus. He's the reason for the season. So, God, I pray that you would help us to be that example in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're a listener who doesn't know Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're not born again of God's Spirit, today's the day of salvation. Jesus could come back right now, and if he were to come back right now, and if you're not saved, you're going to get left behind, and you're going to have to meet the most horrible person this world has ever seen, the Antichrist. We at First Congregational Church don't want that to happen to you. And so we ask you, come to Jesus, accept him into your heart. And if you would just pray this real simple prayer with me, you can punch your ticket for the rapture on Airline Jesus. So just pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to cleanse me from my iniquities. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior. I surrender to you. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that for the first time, happy birthday. Today truly was your day of salvation. One, one last favor I ask of you. If you could just go and tell a Bible preaching pastor or friend, someone you trust, what you did. Tell them how you accepted Christ into your heart. Because there's something about speaking out what we do that builds up our faith in Jesus. Well, from, from the rest of us at First Congregational Church, we'll see you next week. And may God bless you all the days of your life.